Good morning. Happy Thanksgiving. My heart is feeling a little full at the reality of actually being able to be here, some of us together, celebrating this day. So it is just so good to, uh, I don't know, when it will wear off when I feel like each week that we're able to come together, uh, some of us, it just feels good. So, so good to be with you this morning. Uh, just, I just want to highlight a couple of the announcements up there, and I particularly want to highlight the first one so that you would know that next Sunday, Flavio Caron, who many of you have met, uh, Flavio uh, came, well, in February, I think, of 2020, and uh, helped us to, um, not to begin, but to continue to work through what it means for us to be a community that is living out of our truth and reconciliation uh, obligations and the calls to action uh, from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that uh, came um, forth from that commission. And so uh, after this summer and the news that was coming out from various places about uh, uh, unmarked graves, uh, news that uh, is going to continue to come forth because there's going to be more unmarked graves that are found across the country. Uh, I think for a lot of people that was a very, um, that was a, a very big moment um, in the wider community in particular of uh, deeper awareness of the reality of what um, has gone on in residential schools and the, and the kind of trauma that Indigenous people have lived with. And so we've invited Flavio to come and talk to us again, this time in the context of those discoveries as a, as a way of helping us to um, work through our response to, to that news. And uh, he will host a circle after uh, the worship service. We'll um, do our best to keep folks at a distance and to get the ventilation in here so that that feels as safe as it possibly can. So I encourage you to come and be a part of that next week, and we will also record that so that um, uh, people can access it from home online. And the other thing that uh, I wanted to, uh, well, in that same vein is the book study group, of course, that Carla's going to get up and running soon. Lots of you have said to her that you want to be a part of that, and so you can talk to her today if that's something that you would like to engage in this year. I know that that uh, was a very transformative experience for folks who, who gathered and did the reading uh, over last year. Uh, the other announcement I have to make is about uh, your offerings today. Many of you have made your offerings through uh, pre-authorized remittance, or you are making offerings uh, to the church through e-transfers. Uh, we're grateful for those offerings that uh, many of you have already made. If you have brought with you today a physical offering that you want to make, there is an offering box at the back of the sanctuary, and you will see that box brought forward uh, near to the end of the worship service as an act of uh, offering all of uh, what we have given uh, out of gratitude for the life and the work of the church. And so uh, if you've missed the box, it's there, and you can just slip back during the service and uh, put your offering in, in the box. Those are all the announcements I have this morning for the good of the church. Is there anything else? Let's take a moment to prepare our hearts, our minds, and our bodies to be in a spirit of thanksgiving together. The welcome that we extend at Mount Seymour is as broad and as deep as we can make it. So you are welcome here if this is the first time you've been or the first time you've been in a while or if you're joining us online or this is the place that you call home. You're welcome here no matter how old or young you are, wherever you are on life's journey, whatever your marital status, 
your sexual orientation, your gender identity or expression. You're welcome here, whatever your financial background, your ethnic or cultural heritage, whether you consider yourself to be a Christian or part of another faith tradition, or you're someone who seeks to explore the mysteries of life and serve the ideals of compassion and justice and peace. And as people who follow the reconciling way of Christ, we remember that long before Jesus walked the earth, teaching by way of story, people were on this land. And we remember that this land in particular was the land of the Coast Salish people, the unceded and ancestral territory of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil nations. And each time we gather, we remember this and we recommit ourselves to, the, to reconciliation with our indigenous neighbors in our community and in our country. Once there was someone, once there was someone who said such wonderful things and did such amazing things that people followed him. They wanted to know who he was. And once when they asked him who he was, he said, I am the light of the world. In this community of faith, we celebrate that this light is within each and every one of us. It's the light that unites us and makes us one, even when we are not physically together. It's what animates our living, and it is what guides us on our way. Every year on this particular weekend, we set aside time in our lives to pause. Time to pause and to gather with friends and family, whether we do that in person or whether we do that via the magic of the internet. We come together to give thanks. We come together to give thanks for the harvest for the bounty of the earth, and for all that has been provided for the nourishment and well-being of our bodies and of our spirits and souls. For the very miracle, the very miracle of being here on this day, the gift of life itself. 
So let's come together now as one people, one people united in prayer. Source of life, you gather together the threads of our lives, our joys and our sorrows, our successes and our flaws, and you weave us into one seamless garment. You make us to be one body. Strengthen the ties of compassion and justice that bind us together and our commitment to be your gracious presence in our world. Awaken us to all that is gift in our lives. Remind us of the abundance of your provision. Gladden our hearts, deepen our trust, nourish our souls, and revitalize us for the journey ahead. Amen. So I'm going to invite any of the children that are present that would like to go with Anne to do that as we gather together and sing.
Good morning. Whether you take what is written in the Bible as fact, metaphor, myth, or story, listen to these words now for the meaning they hold for you on this day. And the reading is from Matthew 6, verses 20 through 5 to 34. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more of, of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink? Or what will we wear? For it's, for it's the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Hmm. May the Spirit bless us with wisdom and wonder as we ponder the meaning of these words for our lives. Well, if there's one thing that rubs me the wrong way, it's being told not to feel what I am actually feeling. I think that this uh, likely comes from an experience I had many, many years ago when I was bawling my eyes out and my eldest brother said to me, oh, don't worry, don't cry, everything is going to be okay. But I was upset and I was crying and being told not to be upset, right, was not actually helping me in any way. And so today's scripture reading, which begins with Jesus telling us not to worry, his words implying that everything's going to be okay, this has often kind of irritated me. I would much prefer that Jesus say to us, I can see that you are worried and I understand. And I would especially like to hear Jesus say that to us at this particular moment in history, because everything is actually not okay. You can't see yourselves, but it's naturally not okay to see you looking like this, sitting out there. Much is unraveling in our lives, there is division, and there is fear in the land, and many people are worried. So telling us not to worry these days is a bit like telling us not to breathe. We, not, we may not be worrying 24-7, but there is definitely this air of anxiety about. And those worries are showing up in all kinds of ways. They're showing up in the deterioration of our mental health. They're showing up in people protesting in the streets. And they are showing up in our sheer exhaustion from trying to keep ourselves safe and from this kind of continual adaptation that we are needing to make for a new ways of being in our world. And so if to breathe is to live, then um, I think that to live might be to worry. Not all of the time, but at least some of the time. Surely that's why over 2,000 years ago, Jesus felt compelled to address this subject 
this subject of worry and preoccupation and stress, a topic which is, was relevant then, it's still relevant for us today and maybe more this day or this era that we are in than we have experienced for a long time. But I don't actually think that this scripture reading is about worrying. I think what's being addressed is something much deeper, and worry is just a symptom of that. What's really at the heart of today's reading, I think, is our human need for control. And in case there's any doubt of that, notice the things that we are specifically being asked not to worry about. Money, food, clothing, material possessions, the things in life that when we have them make us feel like we are in some kind of control, the things that give us comfort and give us a sense of security. This week, after uh, the news that there was an underwater earthquake off the west coast of Vancouver Island, I listened on the CBC to Gloria Makarenko hosting a call-in program about earthquake preparedness. And uh, all kinds of people were phoning in or emailing their uh, tangible ways that they are preparing for the big one. And my favorite person who um, called in had just about everything that you could imagine needing following an earthquake. Uh, this guy had like gallons and gallons of water and food and matches and an axe to cut wood with to make a fire and cash and a wind-up uh, radio and pairs of shoes under his bed and the tools to turn off the natural gas, right? Because we need that. And not only did he have all of these items at hand, he had thought very carefully about where they were stored in his house, like the most earthquake-proof places in his house is where the, he has these things stored. Talk about worrying. The only thing that stopped me from having a full-blown panic attack listening to this and had listening to how prepared this person was and how unprepared I was was the thought that he might actually be away on a holiday when the big one hits, right? And all his preparations would be for naught. There's no doubt that storing up food and clothing and water can give us a sense of feeling like we are in control of our lives in the face of uncertainty, uh, the uncertainty of natural disaster and other uncertainties. It feels a whole lot better than doing nothing and having nothing when things are spinning out of control. Let us not forget the toilet paper fiasco of the spring of 2020. We all remember, right? The pasta aisle in the superstore, like for yards, the pasta aisles were completely empty of pasta. I could not buy spaghetti. It was all gone, right? By all means, we should prepare for an emergency, but we should also remember that we cannot control everything that happens in our world, no matter how prepared we are for every eventuality. And so thankfully, what's being asked for in today's scripture reading isn't really about living a worry-free life. There are always going to be things that are beyond our control that make us feel anxious from time to time. Today's reading is really about helping us to focus our lives in such a way that we mitigate our need for worry. What Jesus is actually inviting us into in this passage is what he refers to as the heavenly realm, the kingdom of God. It's a way of being. It's a way of being that focuses on what God focuses on. And what is that? An existence where people look out for one another, where they share what they have, where they take what they need and they leave the rest for others. And they do that because they trust that what is needed will be provided. And that trust helps them to let go 
of their need to cling and to control. In one of the most challenging lines in this passage, we're told not to be like the Gentiles who strive after creature comforts. We're really being told not to act like non-believers. And the irony of this is that most of us do act like non-believers most of the time. So, you know, we, we come to church, we say we believe, but we're functional atheists. We might say that we trust God to provide for our every need, but when push comes to shove, we're kind of more comfortable with providing for ourselves, right? Just in case, just in case God doesn't come through in the end. It is very hard to live our lives in an open-handed way, an open-hearted way, and it's hard for us to do that when things feel like they're out of control. This is why we're kind of in this clingy, uh, moment, right? It's hard to be like this when things are out of control. So Jesus gives us some really simple instructions on how to cultivate our trust in God's gracious provision. All we have to do, he says, is to pay attention. Look at the birds. Consider the lilies. Although it's not explicitly stated here, what's being encouraged is the cultivation of an attitude of gratitude, an attitude that helps us to notice the mysterious provisions that come our way in life, come to us freely, often unbidden. Brother David Stendhal Rass, the Benedictine month and interfaith scholar, he's famous for his teachings on gratitude. He says that one of the ways that we do this, one of the, way, the ways that we cultivate this way of being in the world is by building stop signs into our lives. I think that for a lot of people, the pandemic has been a kind of a stop sign. I regularly hear people talking about the way they have taken stock of their lives through this pandemic, not taking stock of canned goods, taking stock of their lives. I also hear people beginning to talk, it's October now, people are talking about their lives as things open up, starting to get a little bit more busy. Not everybody, but I'm hearing this, right? We're busy again. And so I think it's important for us, especially as this gear shift begins to happen, that we do take the time to build in these stop signs into our lives. And that's really what this weekend, it's really what this day is all about. It's about intentionally stopping to notice, to notice what we have been given and to offer our thanks. In the traditional way of doing that, we pause to give thanks for the harvest. Before there were grocery stores, this is the time of year that the farmers would gather everything into their barns. The canning and the preserving would begin for the non-growing season ahead. And the community would gather together to give thanks that creation had provided enough, enough fruits and vegetables and fish and game to carry them through the leaner months. And there was an honoring of the abundance of the earth and the sea and the sky. Because unlike us, they knew that if they ran out of potatoes in the middle of January, they were not going to be able to run down to the Safeway to get them, right? And they knew that they had to share their harvest with one another, so there would be enough for everyone. In her book, Grateful, The Transformative Power of Giving Thanks, uh, Diana Butler Bass talks about how she spent a good portion of her life um, worrying that she was an ingrate. Being grateful was something that was difficult for her, and it was difficult because she disliked the notion of debt duty, and the required reciprocity that often goes along with our expressions of gratitude. So you know how this goes. I invite you to my house for dinner, and then you feel obligated 
to invite me back to your house, right? That give and take. It can be very difficult to give and to freely receive without any strings attached. Diana Butler Bass, because she knew that, she set to stu out to study the topic of uh, gratitude and more importantly, the practice of giving thanks every day. And one of the many things that she noticed was that gratitude is inherently social. She says it always connects us as individuals to others. And when the worst of what that can be, it makes us feel beholden to one another, like I was just talking about that back and forth around the dinners. But in the best of what giving thanks can be, she says it feels joyful. It makes us want to reach out and share our gifts. It deepens our awareness of our common humanity, of humility, of the blessings in our lives. And it calls us to focus on and to build the world that God envisions, which is really what I think Jesus is referencing in today's reading, focusing on the realm of God. Earlier this week, I listened to a Thanksgiving reflection from Jon Snow. Jon Snow is the Indigenous minister for our region here in British Columbia and the church. And he talked about how our Thanksgiving celebrations harken back to the first gatherings in the eastern part of North America, when many indigenous people came together with settlers to help them to prepare for the winter months ahead. He talked about the common bond that was forged between those communities when our ancestors came together to help one another to survive. He didn't mention this in his reflection, but I know from other Indigenous leaders that Indigenous culture is a gift-giving culture. That means that it's not transactional in the way that Diana Butler Bass was referencing it, the way she's experienced white culture to be. There's no sense of, I give you something and you give me something back. It is a culture that is based on a deep, knowing of the way that the Creator provides. That's why the land is so important, staying close to the land. It is true that there is much in our world that is not okay right now. So much is unraveling. There's fear and there's division in the land. And we are worried. We are worried. Yet all around us, creation is teeming with abundance, pulsing with possibility. And we are part of it. We are part of that. We too are God's great provision for one another and for the world. And so as we stop, as we pause to give thanks this day, uh, may our gratitude unite us. May it bond us together. May it ground us, and may it steady us for the uncertain times ahead. May it be so. Amen. on your yellow ribbons today. The invitation is to write on the yellow ribbon one thing that God has provided for you. And I'm imagining there's more than one thing. And feel free to write the more than one things that come to you. One thing that you have a sense that you know deeply that God has provided for you. And then after the service is over, we'll take them outside and we'll tie them on the trellis to remind us that being grateful is another thing that binds us together.
As we begin our prayers today, I invite you to prepare your hearts and your minds by taking a few slow, deep breaths and closing your eyes or lowering your gaze so that we can open ourselves to the awareness of the presence of God in our midst. And in the silence, I invite you to make a fist with your hands. Imagine in those clenched fists the people and the places and the experiences that you're holding tightly. Your own fear, anxiety, or worry, grief, loneliness, helplessness, situations in your personal life, in our community, or around the world that have you tied up in knots. And I invite you to slowly open your fists and imagine a letting go into the loving embrace of the Spirit who transforms and makes all things new. As we let go and open up, you may notice that our hands and our hearts are more ready to hold with love the concerns of others and the pain of the world. O oh God of love and grace, we pray for all these things that we're holding tightly in our fists. Help us to loosen our grip on those things that make us feel tied up in knots. We pray especially today for those in our congregation and dear to us who are undergoing treatments, recovering from surgery, awaiting surgery, or struggling with a diagnosis. We pray for Jim and Sanjay and Pat and Jean Wilkinson. We pray for healthcare workers and other frontline workers who are feeling worn out and exhausted. And we pray for our community here and beyond, where the effects of COVID have caused divisions and broken relationships. Help us to work through those divisions, to come together and be united in common goals and understandings. We pray for Indigenous people in Canada. Their voices are heard and their trauma is recognized. And that their children's remains and missing women's lives matter. We pray for the countries in the world in need of justice, peace, and restoration for Afghanistan, Israel and Palestine, Haiti, and Pakistan. We pray for our planet, that we are united in our efforts to reduce climate change. And we pray for the places who feel the effects most deeply with extreme weather, and flooding. O 
On this Thanksgiving Sunday, we give thanks for the blessings in our lives, for families and loved ones who are gathering this weekend. And we pray for those who have an empty place at the table this year. God of mercy and peace, tune our hearts and our minds to your wisdom, that together we may be agents of your love in the world, creating unity where there is division and hope where there is despair. These ties that bind us together remind us that we are all connected and continue to call us to actively share your light and your love with the world. Amen.
Mm -hmm. As you leave the sanctuary today, I invite you to take your ribbons and to tie them onto the lattice out the front of the church. Uh, when I say the words, and this is, you are invited uh, to respond, the tie that binds us. And this is, we are abundantly provided for by our gracious God. And this is, we are united as a thankful people. And this is, and we are called to go out, live lives, paying attention to the goodness that is all around us. And this is, and we are called to share what we have been given with a world that is in great need. And this is also, so let us go surrounded by our great and abundant God. Let us go carrying deep within our hearts and souls the peace of Christ. And let us go guided by a spirit of wisdom, truth, and beauty this day and always. Amen.